Hello, good to see you. Pastor Sam with a devotion from Daniel chapter 2. Today we are going to find out the dream. The dream. Unless, of course, you read God's word, in which case, good for you. Good for you. Uh, we're going to find out the dream that the king had and what it means. Daniel's going to kind of explain it. I'm going to explain it a little bit further, uh, but we'll get into all of that today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are picking up at verse 24. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel, and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. 
but Daniel remained at the king's court. Okay, uh, so we're going to kind of go through this one. Last time, if you didn't watch last time's devotion, there was basically this order from the king that the king's wise men be able to tell the dream that he had, that, that, that he had dreamed and also to be able to tell its interpretation, and no one could do this. Uh, but Daniel prayed to God, and God revealed the dream to Daniel. So now here, finally, uh, we get clued in on what the dream was. All throughout chapter 2, we don't know what the dream is. It's been revealed to Daniel, we know that, but it hasn't been revealed to us, the readers of this book. So there's some kind of literary tension going on. We're anxious to find out what in the world is this dream that's so important. Uh, so here's kind of one of the themes, I guess I would say, of the chapter. Uh, taking credit, right, taking credit. Arioch comes in and says, I have found someone who will, who will do what you want. So Arioch is taking credit, really, for finding Daniel, when actually it was the other way around. Daniel came to Arioch uh, and said, hey, I can do this. So Arioch is sort of falsely wanting to take credit for what Daniel is about to do. By contrast, Daniel is not going to take credit. Right, here we go. Are you able to make known to me the dream and its interpretation? And Daniel says, no. No one can do this, which is the answer that the king's own wise men gave to him way earlier in the chapter. No one can do this. But, Daniel says, uh, so he doesn't say, I can do it. He says, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. So Daniel is not taking credit even for what he's about to do. And say, he says, my God, paraphrasing a little bit, he says, my God is the God who gives mysteries and reveals mysteries. Right before in Daniel's prayer, he's the God who gives wisdom and strength. So all these things that Daniel has... He, he, he credits as coming from God, right? He understands that nothing is his uh, kind of in the modern sense of the word. These are my clothes, my body, uh, my life, right? These are things that we perceive to have owned uh, but falsely perceive as such. All things are gifts from God, I can say. Uh, he, God, made known to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so here's kind of a, it's not quite a technical term. In the latter days, right, latter days, anytime we see uh, latter days, day of the Lord is kind of a related concept, I would say. The prophets, um, especially the minor prophets, will talk about the day of the Lord. Not the end times as such, uh, but really, I guess I would say the messianic era. Right, the Messianic era. And we're going to talk about that when we get to the dream and the statue and especially the stone. The Messianic era. So latter days, we can understand as the Messianic era, the era of the Messiah. Or, since we're Christians, the era of Jesus Christ. Right? Which would be the A.D., right? The year Anum Domini, year of our Lord. That's what A.D. stands for. That's why B.C. or C.E. is so naughty. Right? Common era is so naughty because it takes away the year of our Lord. So don't use CE, use AD. It's been AD for 2,020 years. Uh, don't give in to peer pressure, right? Um, anyway, here we go. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, so Daniel, again, he's reinforcing this mystery is revealed to me not because I'm any more wise, Right? Uh, but really, for your service, king. So Daniel, he's trying to like push away all of the credit. Now we'll find out what ends up happening to him. Daniel gets promoted. So sometimes there's this idea, and this is kind of selfish, this is not the right way to think about these things, but sometimes there's the idea that like if I push away all the credit, I'm not going to get any credit. Um, and I'm not saying push away the credit in order to get stuff, because that's not the right mindset. But that's maybe a fear of ours. If I don't take the credit for it, people aren't going to know 
what I'm doing. And that's not the point, whether people know what you're doing. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is we shouldn't be taking credit for these things because they come to us from God. And so we just have to kind of let things fall where they may, right? Yeah, maybe you won't get a cool thing uh, that you would have maybe gotten if you had taken credit for it, right? But, but we should be about giving the credit to God and then sort of letting things happen as they're going to happen, right? Daniel gives, again, Daniel has such wonderful uh, Christian life lessons. He's just, that's not, I wouldn't say that's even the point of the book. This is just in the living of a faithful life. There are all of these examples and lessons to give to other faithful followers of God. That's, that's maybe one of the points of the book. But Daniel, he's very consistent about uh, like pushing away the credit and he still gets a really cool reward. So don't be worried about pushing away the credit. Okay, so here's the dream. Here's the dream. Uh, verse 31. The image mighty and of exceeding brightness stood before you and its appearance was frightening. Daniel never really goes into detail in his explanation about the brightness or the frightening appearance of the statue. Okay, so here's, before we interpret, we have to talk about interpreting. Okay, um, Daniel prophesies, which is to say he foretells the future, uh, concerning the messianic era, concerning the, the coming of Christ and, and the work of Christ in the world. Now, in our interpretation of chapter 2 and of the book of Daniel as a whole, we are going to be concerned with Daniel's work in so far, no, I should say in that it shows us Christ. Okay, um, I'm going to kind of jump down to another thing. So again, I've been reading the Concordia commentary. It's a very deep commentary, but it's a very uh, full and rich commentary. So one of the things that they dealt with in that commentary is, is sort of the extent to which we should interpret. What are the details that we should latch on to and, and pursue uh, in, in an effort to find their meaning? And what are details that, that are, I don't want to say irrelevant, um, but what are details that, that have no corresponding interpretation? That's, that's kind of what I'm talking about right now. So where does he say the feet or the toes? Okay, as you saw, feet and toes. So think about a statue. And, and the head is gold, and the chest is silver, and the torso and the thighs are bronze. The shins, the lower legs, are iron, and then the feet are iron and clay. Okay, so here's an example of going too far. Okay? Toes, feet and toes. Well, feet have ten toes. So therefore, since the statue has ten toes, we are going to look for ten states or provinces within this fourth kingdom, and we're going to try to figure out what are the ten provinces that get broken up, and okay, here's the list of the ten, and so now we're going to track. See, Daniel never, he, he doesn't worry about the toes. Okay, that's an example of going too far into this prophecy. Yes, you very well could, and, and, and oftentimes the problem is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You're, you're looking for ten provinces, so of course you're going to find ten provinces. You can always find something to support an a priori hypothesis, right? If you come to this prophecy with, with a given, with a statement, and, and I'm doing that, Right? I'm acknowledging that. I'm, I'm coming to this prophecy assuming that it's talking about the Messiah. And so I'm going to be looking for things that talk about the Messiah. But that's the point of the prophecy. Uh, the fact that there are ten toes, I would say, is irrelevant to the messianic nature of the prophecy. For that matter, Daniel never tells us that there are ten toes. Maybe the statue had one of his toes cut off. Right? The, the toes are not the point. So trying to find some kind of modern interpretation in, in the toes, in the fact that there are ten toes and to look for ten, whatever, that's too far. 
That's taking the prophecy and taking God's word too far. How do we know that? Well, Daniel doesn't say a thing about the toes. Right? The text does not talk about the toes. It simply mentions that there are toes. So we're not going to be concerned with things that the text is not concerned. Right? We are going to concern ourselves with those things that the text finds concerning, which is to say we're going to let the prophecy guide our interpretation. Okay, so the fact that there are ten toes, which first of all we don't know, uh, we're, we're assuming that the statue does have, uh, we're not going to be looking for ten provinces within the fourth kingdom and trying to figure out who they are and then look for some kind of hidden meaning. That's the problem, is we're taking a prophecy about the Messiah and, and, and in the search for the ten toes, totally disregarding the Messiah. So we're trying to take what is at best, I would say, a, a tertiary point, the fact that there are, because there might not even be ten toes, right, we're throwing away, or at least ignoring, the fact that this prophecy is talking about the Messiah and the Messianic age, and we're trying to look for some hidden meaning. Problem is, we never know if what we've come up with is correct or not because we're always going to be able to find what we're looking for, right? You've maybe seen this. Um, you, can, you can support anything with a Bible verse, right? You can find a Bible verse to support anything you want. Uh, that's, that's taking God's word and using it for something other than its intended purpose. If you would look at those verses in their context and you would appreciate them in light of, of their of their consistent meaning, you would find that they don't support whatever weird and twisted thing. So we're not going to be worried about toes today. That's an example of going too far. We're going to let the text guide what we talk about and what we don't talk about. That's that's how I am going to handle all prophecy, right? Especially the prophecy in Daniel because it is messianic in nature, and especially the prophecy of chapter 2. Okay, so let's go back. Now again, since Daniel doesn't make anything of this, that was our point of departure. I'm not going to make anything of this. Okay, the statue was, because we could say, here's another example, exceeding brightness. Oh, Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was exceedingly bright, so therefore this, this statue uh, must somehow be Jesus but it's getting broken, and so Jesus is broken. In, see, in his death on the cross, right there, that sounded reasonable. Uh, except the statue can't be Jesus because the stone is Jesus. We're going to get to that. I spoiled it. Uh, so Jesus can't be. The fact that the statue is exceedingly bright is just a detail. And it's a detail that we're going to let go. Why? Uh, because Daniel lets it go. So there, there, is, there is much that we could say, but we have no idea if we're right. No idea. So we're going to move on to, to that which we can know we are right. Okay, the head of gold, uh, the chest and arms of silver, the middle or torso and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet, iron, and clay. Now, here's... Here is the messianic nature of the prophecy. A stone that was cut by no human hand. So if something does not happen by people, it is divine action. That's what that means, by no human hand. That's, that's another way to say this is a divine action. It is an act of God. The stone was not cut by a person. The stone was cut by God. This is a divine thing. In the back of our minds, we need to remember that God controls all of human history. So really, we could think all of these things have at least divine impetus, right? Kind of divine uh, force to maybe use sort of a hand-waving phrase the stone is divine, its origin is divine, right? It is cut by no human hand. So think about, and I said the stone is Jesus, so I, I stick by that. Jesus' origin is divine. First of all, in his pre-incarnate uh, state, he is begotten of the Father, so he is 
God of God, very light of light, very God of very God. We say in the Nicene Creed, begotten, not made. So Jesus' origin is divine. He is begotten of the Father from all eternity. Jesus' human origin is likewise divine in nature. He is, um, how does the creed say it? How does the creed say it? Begotten of the Father from I need to pause and look. I can't think. I can't think how that line goes. Isn't that embarrassing when you forget the Lord's Prayer or the creeds? Okay. Uh, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. So Jesus' origins are, are again, divine. Jesus' Father is God, both in his pre-incarnate state as the Son of God and then in his uh, human and in, in his human and divine natures in, in the person of Christ, uh, for God is his father. Yes, Mary is his mother. Um, that's, that's less the point at the present. So Jesus' origin is divine, both his pre-incarnate, kind of Old Testament state, and, and his bodily, human and divine state. He has divine origins. He is the son of God, right? The stone is cut by no human hand. So the person that we're talking about has divine origins, okay? It struck the image on its feet and broke them, of, broke them in pieces. So there's going to be a lot of striking action uh, in this dream. And here's the point of connection. The messianic era will impact human history during the reign of the fourth kingdom, right? Each of the things of gold represent a kingdom in what we can now say is human history. Although for Daniel, it would be the present because Daniel is living during the reign of the first kingdom, the head of gold. Uh, so from Daniel's perspective, these are, these are future prophecies ultimately ending in the messianic era, the era of Christ. From our perspective, we can look back and we can definitively state Here's kingdom one, here's kingdom two, kingdom three, kingdom four. And we're going to do that as we go through. The messianic era impacts human history during the fourth kingdom. When did Jesus Christ live? During the Roman Empire. Roman Empire. The legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay is the Roman Empire. That's the fourth kingdom. Okay? First, so since I'm going into this, first kingdom is Babylon. That's easy. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. Second kingdom, who took over Babylon? That would be the Persians. Technically, the Medes and the Persians, they were a combined kingdom, but the Persians. Who defeated the Persians? That would be the Greeks. And who defeated the Greeks? That would be the Romans. And who defeated the Romans? Well, Jesus. Jesus. Interestingly enough. And there has arisen no... Uh, worldly, unified, worldly kingdom since the first advent of Christ. That's, that's an interesting point on its own. Um, Babylon was, we can call it, a kingdom that ruled all the earth. Persia, all the earth. Greece, Rome. Rome, like no kingdom before it, ruled the known world. I realize North and South America are kind of excluded from this. Um, but then Christ, the kingdom of Christ, does in fact rule all the earth in a way that none of these kingdoms has. And in a way uh, that no other kingdom, I think, will. I think there will not be another worldwide empire like the Roman Empire. Or another worldwide empire where one singular nation will rule all the earth. I don't think that will occur. That, that's sort of not stated directly in Daniel, but I think is a secondary point. Um, anyway, so the Messianic era will impact human history during the fourth kingdom. Jesus dies and rises under the, uh, under the Roman Empire, right? Pontius Pilate and um, King Herod and, and all these good folks. So the fourth kingdom is the Romans, the Romans. Then, here's what's interesting. Um, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold all are broken in pieces. So you can think about, and we're getting a little bit into history here, no empire exists 
in a vacuum or on its own. Each, each empire is, is in some way beholden to the empires that have come before it. So what I mean is that the culture and methods of thought of Empire One will permeate Empire Two. Now they may be modified, they may be added to, certain aspects may be um, uh, shamed, right? But there are schools of thought and modes of thought and, and cultural uh, things from Empire One that will still endure during Empire Two. Things in Empire 1 and 2 that will endure during Empire 3, 1, 2, and 3 that will endure during Empire 4. So the Roman Empire is not wholly, entirely, 100% Roman to the utter exclusion of all prior empires and kingdoms. Think, think about the Roman pantheon, right? the Roman uh, collection of gods. How many of them have direct Greek counterparts? Right? That's not proving my point necessarily, but that's kind of that's what I'm talking about. So these Greek gods come over into the Roman pantheon, and the god I don't know I don't I don't know them well enough. Ares and Mars, right? I think that's the god of war in Greece and Rome. Uh, the Romans take the Greek gods and they just give them Roman names. Right? That that's what I'm talking about. So it's not as though these empires fall and they're utterly abolished and they're completely forgotten about. Did you know, did you know uh, that we have a 24-hour day because of the Babylonians, right? The Babylonian people loved the number six. That was like their favorite number in the world. So the day was divided into four six-hour periods. That's why we have a 24-hour Day. Why do you think an hour is 60 minutes? Well, there's the number six, right? Why do you think a minute is 60 seconds? It would be so much easier if it were 50 or 100, right? Then you could actually do math. Well, blame the Babylonians, right? So something from Babylon that Daniel is experiencing now has still kept to 21st century America. That's crazy, right? Well, no, that's what tends to happen. Certain things are kept maybe not even intentionally, but the fact that we have a 60 second minute and a 60 minute hour and a 24 hour day, you can thank Babylon for all of those things because they loved the number six. That was their favorite number. So all those things are divisible by six. There we go. That's why. Anyway, getting too far afield. So my point is that this statue, uh, the statue is not destroyed bit by bit. Right? That's not how the dream goes. The dream doesn't say that the silver chest destroyed the golden head and the golden head was gone. And then uh, the bronze torso destroyed the silver chest and the silver chest... No, the statue endures. The statue continues. And we would kind of think about empires building upon what came before it, but there's a note of inferiority in each successive empire. So here's what Daniel says. Um, another kingdom inferior to you shall arise. So we can posit, we can assume that Babylon is the pinnacle of human existence. Right? The kingdom of Babylon and the time of Babylon is now, of course, not counting the Messianic age, um, but is the pinnacle of human achievement. That which the Babylonian Empire had and, and kept sacred, not in the religious sense, kept valuable, that that was the pinnacle of humanity. And ever since then, it's been a low, slow, steady degrade down to, well, our present circumstances. Another kingdom inferior. Now, Daniel doesn't say in what ways it is inferior. And so, again, we're going to stop our analysis, and we're not going to venture beyond the boundaries that Daniel provides, and, and therein the boundaries that God provides for us. We're not going to suppose what are the ways in which the Persian Empire is inferior to the Babylonian Empire. We can, since Daniel does say they are inferior, we can assume that each one is successively inferior, just as silver is worse than gold, and bronze, at least in value, is worse than silver, um, 
and then iron is worse than bronze, they get successively less valuable. So we can infer that the Babylonian Empire is the most valuable and the most superior kingdom of man. Again, not counting the Messianic era. Okay, where did I leave off on this? Um, okay, uh, no, let's keep going on this. They become like chaff of the summer threshing floors. So think about gold, silver, bronze, iron, weighty materials, heavy. They, they, are not in, they are not by nature things that are blown around. They are things that have uh, usually permanence. Think about silver and gold do not degrade or rust. Uh, as time goes on, they retain their superior properties. Uh, but by contrast, in the dream, they become like chaff. And so, contrary to their natural, they behave in ways that are contrary to their natural properties. You would never, if you had a bunch of gold, uh, even gold jewelry, right, if you threw it up, even in a high wind, it's not going to go very far. Your jewelry is pretty much just going to come right back straight down. If, by comparison, you threw up a bunch of straw in a strong wind, well, that straw is never going to touch the earth again. It's going to keep on blowing. So these, these metals and these kingdoms that seem so permanent really show their impermanence. They become like chaff, and the wind uh, drives them away so that not a trace of them could be found. Well, what, what, what does the dream mean by this? Well, not that no one's ever going to think about them again, not that a 60-second minute is not going to continue, um, but just we don't talk about the Babylonian kingdom. Unless we're doing some kind of history lesson, we don't talk about the Roman Empire unless we're doing some kind of, uh, again, history lesson. We don't fear these things. We don't make decisions today on the basis of these previous empires. That's what, I'm, that's, that's what it means that not a trace of them could be found. Their ability to influence the lives of men has been removed. Right? People don't make decisions because of the Roman Empire. People don't make decisions today because of the Babylonian Empire, at least not as a conscious point of connection. Um, but the stone became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, and again, the stone is Christ. Now, um, I want to go a little bit farther down. Have I missed anything? Okay, so a little, oh, let me, so let me go over again. Um, the head... So the head of gold, again, Babylonian kingdom, another kingdom shall arise after you. That would be the Persian uh, Empire. Technically, the Persians and the Medes, they're combined. But the Persian Empire, the book of Daniel, actually um, straddles the Babylonian Empire to the Persian Empire. So the third kingdom would be the, Bron or the um, Greek kingdoms, and the Greek kingdoms were, were functionally city-states, but, but they were all united in being Greek. And so the Greek empire, or the Greek kingdom, took over the new, known world, which shall rule over all the earth. Now again, um, this, this, it's, it's a directional statement, right? Because think about North and South America, Antarctica, right, for that matter. There's never been an empire that has ruled over Antarctica. So what, what is the Bible? Okay, so the Bible must all be false, right? Because the Romans did not rule over Antarctica. Therefore, the Bible is false. No. No, that's not, that's not the point. That's not the point. Um, in, in, in the thinking of these people and, and in the conception of the world, at this point in history, this statement was true. The Greeks ruled over everywhere that that people knew that there were people, right? There were people in China, there were people in North America, but nobody had any idea they were there, right? They, they just didn't know about these things. So it's a statement, it, it's not meant to be a totalitarian statement. Um, 
it, it's, it's again, it's a directional statement, right? The Greeks ruled everywhere that we knew. There was not like the Greeks and this other empire, and the other empire was over here doing some cool stuff, and the Greeks had pretty much of it. No, the Greeks had everything that they knew about. The Romans had, had even more, right? Had everything that people knew about. They just didn't know about Antarctica. They didn't know about North and South America. Those, those were completely unknown at the time. So that does not mean the Bible is false. It means we have to think in, in the terms of the Bible, right? We have to, we have to place ourselves into uh, the mindset of a hearer in the Babylonian Empire. What, what would all the earth be? Well, pretty much what the Greek Empire had and pretty much what the Roman Empire had, right? Like a bunch of the world. Not the whole entire square footage of the world, not Antarctica, but that's not the point. That's not the point. Um, everywhere that we knew that there were people, that's what the Greeks and the Romans ruled. Same, same thing. I go over this anytime there's an all in God's word, right? Uh, in the Gospels, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem turned out to meet him. Well, does that mean, does that mean there was a lame dude who was living in an alley somewhere and he somehow picked up his bed and came to Jesus? No, that's not what it means. It doesn't mean 100%. It's a directional statement. The same way that you use it when you're talking. Man, that was a great event last night. The whole town was there. You don't expect somebody to stop you and say, well, no, I know that so-and-so wasn't there, so you're a dirty liar. Stop being a horrible... No, you don't expect people to... You're not making a totalitarian statement. You're making a directional statement. There were a lot of people, right? As far as I know, everyone was there. Back to the text. The world that we know was ruled by the Romans. We didn't know about Antarctica. We didn't know about North and South America. Um, the, Bible, the Bible is still true. That's what I'm trying to say. We have to understand it on its terms, not make it mean something on our terms. Uh, let's see. I want to get to the part where... where the things get broken by falling on it. I'm trying to find that now. The, the stone strikes the statue um, and then the stuff falls on it. Did I read that right? I'm going to pause and try to find this because I think I... It's, it's what I'm going to try to say. Hmm. Okay, so I guess it didn't say it the way that I thought it said it. I thought there was more like, right, the stone breaks the feet and then the statue kind of fell on it and got broken. That's what went through my mind. I don't know. I can't find that exactly in the reading. Uh, it struck the image on the feet and broke them in pieces. Then everything is broken in pieces. So anyway, the, the passage that I'm thinking is the one that uh, Christ quotes during uh, Holy Week. What's, what's the setting of it? He's telling one of the parables. Uh, I think it's the parable of the talents. And he says, what is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous on our eyes. If it falls on anyone, it will crush them. And if anyone falls on it, they will be broken to pieces. I think that's only a slight paraphrase of it. But that's, that's the passage that went to my mind, right? Because in that quotation by Christ, he's the stone. And sometimes we think it's weird. Well, if anybody falls on the stone, how can they be broken to pieces? Because we think about like falling at the feet of Christ as a good thing. But, but this, that's what I was thinking when I read this, that the, the kingdoms are falling on the stone and that they're broken in pieces. And that falling on the stone is not intended to be a good thing. And in the quotation by Christ, he doesn't mean it to be a good thing. The way that he phrases it, like both of those are bad. To be crushed by the stone or to fall on the stone, both of them are bad. That's, that's how Jesus presents them. And so when I read this, I was like, wait a minute. That gave me new appreciation for that quote by Christ. I don't know if he's referring to this exactly, but it really kind of fits in this. That the, the rest of this, so the, the stone breaks the feet and the rest of the statue falls on the stone and the statue is broken by virtue of falling on the stone. Right? Um, and then becomes like chaff, and the wind carries them away. So let me go down here. 
Now, divided kingdom. Um, so the Roman Empire, again, the Roman Empire was never defeat. Well, I guess it was defeated by Christ, um, which is kind of a weird thought. Uh, but the Roman Empire didn't fall to another empire. The Roman Empire just kind of fizzled out. Right? Now, there's all kinds of people who will present all kinds of theories about why the Roman Empire fizzled out. But I don't think there's ever been an empire in the history of man that just kind of fizzled, right, in the way that the Roman Empire, they weren't defeated. In theory, they should still be going strong. But here's kind of the nature of the prophecy, partly of clay and partly of iron. So the, the empire was not as cohesive as it ought to have been. There were good parts, there were strong parts, right, the military aspect of Rome, top-notch, like could easily in battle defeat anyone else. But there were other aspects, and again, I'm kind of showing my ignorance. The Roman Senate, which I think was replaced by the emperor, um, showing my ignorance, are, are these kind of aspects of, and again, we're getting beyond the biblical prophecy, so I need to be careful to listen to my own words. Um, but there are parts of Rome that sort of caused its own downfall. Rome didn't really fall to anyone else, it just sort of fell and fizzled away. And the Roman Empire, again, was defeated by Christ. We can, we can tie the prophecy that in the death and resurrection of Christ, all worldly empires are defeated and there is only the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God grows into a huge mountain and covers all the earth. So that's, I think, partly iron, uh, partly, iron, partly clay. What does it say? Mix with one another in marriage. Um, as different ethnic groups mix in marriage, they lose some of their ethnic identity. Think about America. We have no ethnic identity, right? People have certain whatevers, um, and people celebrate whatever different ethnicity, which is fine. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. Uh, but the nation of America has no definitive cultural identity. We, we eat hot dogs and shoot fireworks. That's like as far as our cultural identity goes, which is not even that true of everyone. So as, as different, different ethnic groups intermarry other ethnic groups, it leads to a loss of an ethnic identity. So th think about a Christian and a Jewish person get married together. Well, are you going to celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah? Well, maybe you celebrate both, but probably not as fervently as either one would celebrate on their own. So there's kind of a loss of a unique and cohesive ethnic identity. So the Roman Empire, what Daniel does tell us is that these ethnic groups are all intermarrying and it's sort of just, everything just kind of becomes bland 21st century America, right? We're, what, what are we known for? I don't even know. I don't even stare at what is America known for? Hot dogs and fireworks? I don't know. Anyway. Uh, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, come on mouse, that will never be destroyed. Okay, so the fifth, if we can call it the fifth kingdom, the stone, the messianic kingdom, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there has never arisen since Rome, there has never arisen a worldwide empire. And, and now this, this is my belief, because again, I'm kind of going beyond uh, the prophecy. A, a little bit, I would say, but I am going beyond the prophecy. So this is, this is a matter of my own opinion, that there will not be uh, an empire that will arise, that will rule all the earth, because the empire of Christ does that now in a different way. So again, thinking in terms of the dream, we had all these different metals, and so the Messianic Kingdom is not just another metal, right, because it could have been steel, right, think steel is stronger than iron. Uh, the Messianic Kingdom is not pictured as steel, as another metal, but as a whole different type of uh, object, right, it's a stone. It's a rock which denotes permanence. In the Old Testament, stones were set up as memorials, as altars, 
as well as memorials. Stones denoted permanent. Stones were used as uh, property lines, right? Boundary stones denoted the edge of a property. They were meant to endure through all times. And, and those properties of the stone are connected to the Messianic era, right? The kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ will endure forever because it's, it's a hidden kingdom now. The kingdom of Christ is not as plain and obvious as the Roman kingdom was, or the Greek kingdom was, or the Babylonian kingdom was. You could point to a king and you could say, there's the king, and you could go see him. And you could shake his hand if you were lucky enough, right? And you could see these are the boundaries of the Babylonian empire. You can, you can look it up on Google. Right? What is the Babylonian? And it'll show you a nice little map. What's the boundaries of the Roman empire? And it'll show you a nice little map. And then what's the boundaries of Christianity? And hopefully it pulls up a picture of the world because it's the whole world. Right? The, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ effectively has no boundaries. In, in contrast to the statue, again, going back to the dream, in contrast to the statue that was so large and so fearsome, it only had the appearance of largeness because the stone that supplanted it was indeed large and grew to become large and did, where does it say, and did cover all the earth? Where does it say that? Ah, it said that somewhere. I'm not going to find it. Oh, well. So here, um, King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel, offered up uh, offering and incense to him. So he does not necessarily deify Daniel. That's not the point because Daniel has been very consistent in kind of pushing off the credit. But uh, the king deifies Daniel's God, although not as much as he ought to because the next chapter is going to happen next. Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. This, this sounds like a really great Christian statement. Now again, the word Christian in the Old Testament is a little bit anachronistic, but still. Uh, this, this is the statement of a faithful follower of God. right? Our God is God of God and Lords of, Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. So the king says this, but then, of course, the next chapter is going to happen, and we'll get to that next time. And it shows that the king, he's not a Christian. He's not a follower of God. So I, I think that he is saying the God of Judah is a pretty strong God. I'm going to add him in with all my... So he, in, instead of making the Lord God his God, he makes the Lord God one of his gods. Uh, Daniel gets promoted. He is over the whole prince province of Babylon and chief prefect. Now, here's what's up, because next chapter is the fiery furnace. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get promoted to be in charge of Babylon. Daniel remains at the king's court. So did you ever wonder, maybe you never did, did you ever wonder where in the world is Daniel during the fiery furnace, because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in danger. And Daniel, he's just like off somewhere. He's never in danger, as far as the fiery furnace goes. So did you ever wonder where in the world Daniel was? Well, chapter 2 explains it. Daniel was in the king's court. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, are in a separate place, um, but they're like ruling over Babylon. So they're, they're in like city hall, so to speak. And Daniel is in the White House, again, to try to use 21st century, um, or maybe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're on like Capitol Hill, let's say, to kind of keep everything in Washington, D.C. Uh, but Daniel's in the White House. So when catastrophe strikes Capitol Hill, Daniel is sort of kept out of that. Daniel doesn't have to worry about getting thrown in the fiery furnace, which is what's coming up. In chapter 3, chapter 2 explains it. Look at that. God's word explains <clears throat> itself. Anyway, this dream uh, that the king has and, and the messianic prophecies tell us about Christ. Tell us about the reign of Christ. So Christ comes during uh, the days of the Roman Empire. Christ supplants the Roman Empire, which is interesting 
uh, even as he says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. That's not to say Jesus didn't mean what he said. Uh, the kingdom of Christ permeates this world. The kingdom of Christ is not intended to remain in this world. I, 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 mean, I mean eternal life and, and heaven and the new creation. That's what I mean by that. Uh, that's, that's the intended locale of the kingdom of Christ. So the kingdom of Christ is not concerned with this world as world, as its final um, place of occupancy. The kingdom of Christ is concerned with the, the new reality and the new creation. I had to talk myself out of that one. Anyway, I think that's all the points that I had. So let's pray and be done with this. Dear Lord God, we thank you for the kingdom of your son Christ and for the control that you exercise over all this earth. Help us to remember that you are in control, not just of the big events, but of the small uh, moments of our lives. Help us to trust in you and to follow you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, next time, don't know if we're going to take all of chapter 3 together, but we are at least going to get started on that. So come back and join me for that. God's peace be with you. I will see you then.